Today I am going to talk about economics, and uh, I have a new favorite word, and the word is weedle. And I hope you see the word weedle, and you recognize the topic of discussion that John Adams has in his mind as he makes this statement. Who knows what the topic of discussion is? The topic is political correctness. Oh, they had it then, we have it today, there is nothing new under the sun. These are the same concepts that we plagued our founding fathers that plague us today. Liberty is your right, and it's inalienable. It's inalienable, right? Sometimes you'll hear the word uh, unalienable. Unalienable and unalienable are very similar, and you wonder what they mean. To put a lien on a property is to have a demand on that property. If the property can be liened, it is alienable. If it can't be liened, it's unalienable. Just like you have, you have the inability or the you don't have the ability to accomplish something. So there are two ways to look at this. Webster didn't write his dictionary until 1828. <laughs> And so we, we always say unalienable, like it can't be made alien to us. Both concepts are legitimate. Both concepts talk about rights that come from your creator. They are endowed to you as individuals. I talk about county rights and I talk about states rights, but if you want to get technical, counties don't have rights and states don't have Thank rights. You. People have rights, and only people have rights. These are powerful concepts. We have to learn to argue these ideas in the public square. We have to learn to take these ideas to the media, to our commissioners at the county level. I'm a Klamath County Commissioner today, and I ran for Congress in the 2nd District of Oregon. <coughs> And I was defeated. In fact, all 45 challengers on Primary Tuesday, May 20th, a couple weeks ago, all challengers to all Rhino Republican incumbents on that Tuesday got defeated. Yep. Wow. All 45 yes. got defeated. Look at what that means is you yeah. may claim and your neighbors may claim and everybody may claim things aren't going right. Oh no, I see the toilet swirling. And if you think like that, then by golly, what we need is we need conservatives. We need you, your wife, right. your kids, your family, your grandchildren, if they're old enough to vote. But you guys are a young crowd, so probably not. <laughs> but we need them to stand for these principles. We need them to stand for their own rights. And we need them to be willing to take the battle. Because if we don't take the battle, we're lost. And so it's up to us. Remember earlier Ken was talking about, here was Thomas Benton, a senator from Missouri. How many of you know where the county Benton, Oregon got its name? Wow. Thomas Benton. Why? Because he was arguing for those western states like Florida, but at the same time the Oregon Territory was being settled, and people recognize how valuable this argument would be. In Oregon, they named Benton County after this Democratic um, senator from Missouri. This is fabulous stuff. It's our history. It's what makes us who we are. And we have to understand these concepts so that we can articulate them in front of the public sphere, get these ideas rolling in. Ken has done a great job. He's got the legal stuff down pat. It's great information. I suggest you pick up material and literature that he has as, as well as the American Lands Council website. Most all of these presentations are online as well, and you can download them, you can read up on it, you can cross-reference them, you can check his work if you don't trust him, and, um, and, and power to you, because this is a great time to be alive, and so I'm glad you're here today. I'm glad we got you all back from lunch. 
And, uh, and then I'm going to try and keep you awake because I'm going to hand the ball back to Ken in about 30 minutes. The thing that I want to make clear right now is I'm going to show you the economics. And the economics, quite frankly, look bad. And all of you are going to walk out of here thinking, oh no, this is the swirl in the toilet and we're headed down. How do we get out of this mess? And I'm going to turn that back over to Ken for strategies on how do we, as individual citizens, as county commissioners, as state reps, how do we engage to bring this to the forefront of our legislators' minds? Because this needs to happen, and it needs to happen both at the state level and at the federal level. Right? So we've got our work cut out for us, but remember, in the same way that Thomas Benton was one man with courage, you can go back to our founding forefathers and recognize Thomas Jefferson said, quote, one man with courage is a majority. That's the key. One man with courage is a majority. And so that's really where we want to go. We want to give men and women the courage to fight for these things that are true, right, and doable. Quite frankly, easily doable. I'm going to make a reference here to uh, these are the choices. Unfortunately, these are the choices we're faced with. Look at how these lay out. And this is also from a quote from Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson said, we must not let our rulers, and I think that's apropos today, right? We must not let our rulers load us with perpetual debt. Uh, yeah. Who knows what the uh, deficit looks like today? Yeah. 17, 17 what? trillion. 17 and a half. So how many zeros to make a trillion dollars? What, tell me how many. Yeah, zero, 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 comma, zero, 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 comma, zero, zero, zero. Am I done yet? No. no. Yeah, no. Oh my gosh, and Thomas Jefferson says we must not let our rulers load us with perpetual debt. Instead, we must choose between economy and liberty or profusion, seeming profusion, I'll insert there, profusion and servitude. Welcome to slavery. Welcome to slavery. This is a choice. The choice is yours. And it's up to us to make this happen. I'm going to turn to a um, report that came from, uh, actually, I guess before I get to the report, I'll, I'll just sort of kind of uh, come consolidate ideas about the creation of America. First of all, it was not a revolution in terms of modern terminology. It was not a revolt. It was a counter-revolt, if anything. It was a defensive measure. It was a defensive measure because the crown was usurping the rights and liberties of the colonies. The local legislative power belonged to the colonies, and the crown started taking those legislative freedoms away from the colonies. So they were simply fighting for what was rightfully theirs. This was a defensive maneuver. And they were fighting on it not just because, they were fighting on it because it was a right of theirs. Remember, these are inalienable or unalienable, right? You cannot t put a demand on these. They belong to us as citizens. They belong to us as people. They belong to us because of our human dignity. And so Thomas Jefferson says, this it, it is your duty to rebel against the tyrant. It is your duty. You don't get to get, go buy a soda pop and drive home and leave this on the table. It is your responsibility. It is your obligation to your children and your grandchildren. <clears throat> so this is important stuff to just kind of get the foundation for what we're talking about. Additionally, the idea of sovereignty, the idea of liberty, the idea of I can run my own life better than a bureaucrat starts at the local level. Our local communities were the, are, are where um, we develop these relationships 
for how to run our lives, how to raise our children, what our community looks like, and where we're going from here. How many of you are familiar with Alexis de Tocqueville? He wrote a book, Democracy in America, and as he starts that, he says, I'm going to focus on townships first, because townships, local municipalities, are where the dogma of liberty arises. Townships are what make it happen. Townships are where communities get created and developed. Then I'll move to counties, then I'll move to states, and at that point you'll know and understand what the democracy in the United States of America looks like. And then I'll touch on the federal government and the Constitution, but it's a federation, it's a contract with enumerated powers or obligatory um, uh, ideas that are set out there for that unique federation of free and independent and sovereign states. This is really, really good stuff to have a handle and to have in your hip pocket so that you don't get wheedled out of your liberties. Weedled. So where I'm going to go with this is I'm going to cover economics and I'm going to start with a report that was done in 2012 it was created by the um, Oregon Secretary of State uh, at behest of Governor um, Kitzhaber, and it was an investigation into the financial condition of Oregon counties. They actually investigated, uh, they investigated all 36 counties in Oregon, and they say the results of our analysis indicated the following eight counties may be at higher risk of distress than other counties. Because of the circumstances of these counties, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and then they list them. Can you find your county in this list? Yes. Klamath yes. mm -hmm. is there. Jackson is there. Douglas is there. Uh-oh. Things aren't looking too rosy. I feel the swirl coming on, right? This is like getting a swirly in the uh, boys' gymnasium. <laughs> so here's how the report concludes these things. It says, low permanent tax rates combined with limited taxable property. Right. What does that mean? No money. Federally owned land is taxable. 58%, right. 59%, if I round up, of Klamath County is not taxable. How much in Josephine? 68. 68 in Josephine. Anybody from Jackson? Nobody from Jackson? Yes. You know how much? No, I don't. I'm yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. You got the answer right then. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so Jackson County is at 64%. So all of this land is not taxable. So that's what this red letter edition here says, limited taxable property. And it's this is what Ken is talking about. Why is that property not taxable? Why isn't that property uh, available for development? Why isn't that property, why, 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 what's the difference? That's the question. What's the difference between those on the East Coast and those on the West Coast? And then here's the, this is, these, these guys are brain surgeons, right? <laughs> can constrain a county's ability to raise revenue. Yes. <laughs> That's convenient. They realize what the problem is. Josephine County shows up in this report with the lowest permanent tax rate. I think that means you guys are greedy. The lowest permanent tax rate of 59 cents and 62%, this says 62, I heard 68, non-taxable federal, non federal lands generated the least amount of local revenue at only $191 per capita. So you guys aren't pulling your wage. You're not generating revenue for the local county government. Yep. Right? Yep. Here's the next slide. We do not propose any specific solutions because the decisions about county belong to the county commissioners and taxes and level of service are based on local priorities. Mm -hmm. So really what they're saying is, we're going to ignore the non-taxable land side of the equation. Notice they don't mention the non, because we need to take that land back. That's not in red letters here. 
because the federal government owns lands that they don't have a right to, that's not in red letters here. What's in red letters here is this phrase that says, raising taxes belongs to the local commissioners. Yeah. Guess what you can expect in the near future, right? Raising Our problem is a local issue. Your tax rates are too low. Yep. <laughs> Go ahead, get ready. Levies are coming. Bond measures are coming. Taxing districts are coming in our county. They're trying to create a taxing district for the trapper, a split levy taxing district for public safety, yep. a taxing district for the extension office, and a taxing district for, um, oh, for uh, the sports arena. Because colleges and high schools and junior highs no longer offer sports in their education program. Mm -hmm. So now that the state has pulled back from providing those things, when's the last time you went to a high school, by the way, and saw a wood shop or a metal shop? That's sad. And yet how many of you were in wood shop and metal shop, oh, right. right? Everybody in this room. And they don't offer that today? What's going on here? Where are those resources going? <laughs> No, they're actually going into the pockets of all of the government employees and that's why they're focusing on tax rates. So this becomes a big, big issue. The way to solve the problem isn't by increasing your taxes. The way to solve this problem is by increasing the land mass that becomes taxable. So let's look at how this really works. These will be just some things that make you wonder, right? This is Klamath County. In Klamath County, this pie chart, uh, I created this pie chart it, it, as I blew it up for the screen here. It's, it looks a little fuzzy here. Maybe it, it could get focused. Wait. Say it again? Yeah, that's all you get. This is just acreage, raw acreage, just land mass, number of acres in those different categories up there. Federal land is 59%. That's that big red half moon. Well, actually, it's more than a half moon. It's a three-quarter moon there. That big red pie is acreage in Klamath County that's owned by the federal government. The little residential one is at 4%. The state owns 1%. There's private forests there at 19%. And so everybody has a piece of the pie. And then they all pay taxes based on their land. So look at residential was 4% of the acreage, right? And they pay 65% of the taxes based on that taxable land. <laughs> you as property owners are bearing the brunt of the monies that Klamath County collects in taxes. It's exactly the same across all the counties. I just know my numbers better than I know your numbers. I want you to look at something. I pulled this little slice. Uh, I'll back up one slide. See this federal government slice here? Yeah. I'll grab this cute little laser I got here. <laughs> that right there is the federal government, that red line. Mm -hmm. It corresponds to this giant piece of the pie right there. And here are those two put on the same slide together. 2,245,000 acres generated $911 in tax revenue for Klamath County. 2 million acres generated $911. I'm wondering, what were those accountants at the GSA thinking? They should have got out of that 9-11, right? You know, somebody goofed, right? What were they thinking? Okay, so here's the residential slice. The residential piece right there, that 4% generates this 29,000 acres generates $29 million in taxes. Who's bearing the brunt of this, of this property tax scheme that's in place today? Tell me who is carrying the burden People. That's right. The people are. Uh, De Tocqueville also talks about what happens to a democracy when non-landowners get what he calls universal suffrage. 
when non-landowners get the right to vote, Stakeholders. De Tocqueville take, takes that to, to extreme, you know, widths to understand what would possibly happen. And he says what will happen is they'll obviously take the benefits while putting the burden on those who pay taxes. That's exactly what we're seeing today. This is exactly what De Tocqueville knew in 1830. He started writing Democracy in America when he was 22 years old. I suggest you pick it up and read it. I also suggest if you don't have time to read it, put it in and listen to it. You will be amazed at the items that he covers. He even covers uh, items that are interesting like, would a fraud ever become president of the United States? Right? He does a wonderful job of analyzing it. He says, no, because the president is such a weakling compared to the bicameral Congress where the states have senators who support their perspective and the House represents the people. By the way, this is before the 17th Amendment in 1913 and before the, um, the 16th Amendment in 19. Thirteen, and before the Federal Reserve in 1913. So tell me if you like the year 1913. No. Um, yeah. Thank you. You know, it's thank you anyway. So here, I just want you to rec this ought to make you hum. This ought to make you wonder. This ought to make you think just a little bit. So let's now take a look about. Can the feds pay more? Should the feds pay more? Right? They need to carry their fair weight. I'm going to warn you here, be careful, because they don't have the money. What was that dead number again? Right? Here's an Oregon Department of Forestry. Um, uh, this is harvest levels. The blue bars in the background are um, combined harvest. The um, green bar running through there, right about mid-level, where'd that uh, cute little pointer go? This green bar right here is private harvest. Private harvest didn't get impacted, but look at the federal harvest. This is federal harvest. Look at what happens to the federal harvest. Now, who knows what happened in here? That's the number we want to watch. Right? That line right there, that's the line we want to pay attention to. Because the federal harvest number is where they stopped managing the lands. In the year 2011, uh, 9.3 million acres of forest went up in flames in the U.S. Forest Department. That's not including BLM. Forest Service only, 9.3 million acres went up in flames. How many did we harvest? Remember, I'm talking, and this goes through 2007, I'm talking in 2011. How many acres did we harvest in 2011? 208,000 point, oh two, zero, eight, compared to 9.3. 9.3 million versus 0 0.208 million harvested. Tell me, who, who would raise their hand and say, that's good management, pal, no. right? This is why we have the science, we have the statistics, we have the math, we have the numbers, we have the finances to win the environmental argument. What I need is I need men and women of courage who are willing to bring this debate to the letters to the editor, willing to join in the battle, willing to take part in having this conversation. We need to manage the land in an ecologically sound world. In those 9.3 million acres, how many million animals lost their habitat? Yep. How many watershed miles were destroyed by 9.3 million acres of forest fire? How much damage was done in air pollution or water quality? Yep. And nobody's willing to address this because we're decent, right? Mm -hmm. Go back. Don't get wheedled out of your liberties. I'm going to come to a different chart. This is timber payments. 
This chart here shows um, timber payments. You see up here in the corner, this is where the legend is. Owl payments are, they're kind of purple. You can't see them in this light. This is purple for owl payments. The 25 cent percent forest fund is this line. And uh, this blue is PILT, payment in lieu of taxes or pennies in lieu of trillions. That's what this PILT is. And then this, um, the, these are mineral. This little line down, oh, I'm sorry, this is PILT down here. This blue is secure rural schools. How many of you heard of secure rural schools? Secure rural schools funding is this right here. Starting in the year 2000, this is a three-year average of the highest between 1986 and 1990. Average the three highest years and you get these. And that's where this SRS money comes from. I'm going to do something. I've got a different, the other graph was in billions of board feet of harvest level. This is in dollars. But look at how this matches, right? That's that same, same exact line, just copied from one graph and dropped into this graph. If this is no longer board feed of harvest, where did this money come from? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Where did it come from? 7.5, tr 17 trillion dollars in yeah, debt. Yeah, this, this is deficit spending. This is deficit spending galore. Here's another chart. I'm going to zoom in a little bit on this chart. I'm going to pick this little section right here just so we can see it. This right here is from 1908 through um, through 1937 and uh, actually the start of the war and overall this little line down here that you can hardly even see <laughs> is less than 10 million dollars all the way up to 1940. <laughs> okay here's the next chart Skyrocket. I'm gonna move in here a little bit uh, oh, wow. let me get this to move a little and I'm gonna focus on this section right here we have this section of the graph, and just for reference, that's the 10 million way back there nationwide. I'm not talking about Oregon. This is nationwide. We only harvested and did forest sharing monies on less than $10 million nationwide. <coughs> Here it looks, and that big green number right there, that's <coughs> over a billion dollars in revenue sharing. This is the post-World War II commodity boom. Houses were being built, baby boomers were coming home from the war. We had an enormous economy and lumber and lumber futures and building of homes was going on like mad across the US. This is a market-driven boom. And it was very good for Oregon. I don't think we can create, well, maybe I have a wrong opinion. I was going to say, I don't think we can recreate that housing boom. Um, tell me if we should invest in more housing. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, well, maybe not, right? <laughs> so here's a funny little part that I want you to look at, though. Remember, this is payment in lieu of taxes yeah. because of foregone revenue. This is over a billion dollars. This is 1976. Why is it all of a sudden we're paying more money in payment in lieu of taxes legislation in 1976 when payment in lieu of taxes came on board when we have already got more than a billion dollars in harvest? This is interesting, right? Why? Because there's always money for everybody this is Pilt Payment Counties after the Federal Land um, oh uh, Protection Management Act. Every little county got something. There's only a handful down the middle where they're actually, you know, they, they didn't receive anything. Counties all over the U.S. became part of Pilt. And you heard earlier and, uh, at Ken's website there is a video of Senator Murkowski speaking into a microphone and she says, in the past, we have focused on disposition of federal lands. We are changing our policy with this FLIPMA. We're changing our policy to be one of retention. Mm -hmm. 
And you can see her in a congressional hearing where she voices, we're changing our policy and we're going to purchase support. The power of the purse is our enemy. Remember what Jefferson said. He said, choose between profusion and servitude or economy and liberty. Are you willing to be frugal at the county level? Are you willing to be frugal in your own life or do you like the Bettys too much? These are hard questions. I may sound a little bit like a preacher. On a Sunday morning, a preacher will hammer you about your sin and tell you about salvation at the end of the story. So I'm going to be taking that tact. I'm going to be hammering about the problems that we face, which are of a moral nature. Your rights and your duties are moral obligations, not only to yourselves, but to secure the prosperity that belongs to your family's inheritance. Yes. Remember to secure the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our posterity? Who knows where that phrase comes from? Yeah. yeah. This is good stuff. Let's move on to the next slide here. I gotta remember which one. We're gonna go uh, move further down the line and I'm gonna look at this. Now this is kind of blown up. This is a transition from the commodity um, world that we saw in the prosperous years after World War II. And what we see here is we see, we see this little owl transition payments again. This blue line is the pilt payments again. And this is the harvest. Where is pilt coming from? Where is SRS Title I and Title II coming from? Where is pilt coming from if there's no harvest? Federal Reserve. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Let me drop that same line onto this graph. They're different because this one's in timber volume. The one we're looking at is actually in, um, in dollars. But do you see a parallel? Yeah. I, I'm not sure. Am I dreaming or is there a parallel here? There is. Yeah. So this is, this is really a problem and we see deficit spending is not your friend, but deficit spending is your enemy. Um, that, that slide was already seen, but deficit spending is our enemy. Mm. Do not fall in love with the benefits that come from the federal government because they're teasing you into a man trap. Mm -hmm. Once you get teased into this man trap, the question is how do you get out? I'm sure you've heard the story about uh, you know, a guy who had um, hogs that were you know, giving the, 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 the neighborhood trouble. They're always rooting in the garden and destroying things. And if any of you have been in wild boar country, you know what wild boars do. And they're always chewing up, always coming through. People would put up fencing and then the, you know, the wild boar would you know, come rolling through the fence. And one neighbor says, well, I can, I can catch them. And they say, how? We've been trying. We've got all kinds of traps. They never land in our traps. They just land in our garden. So he says, well, I can do it. How are you going to do it? He starts putting out bowls of feed, just pans, you know, like the horse feeding pan, you know, with oats in it. He's got, he's got all kinds of different goodies for them. They start coming in, they leave, they come in the morning, they come at night, they leave, they come, the, the dishes are always empty, he puts it out again, he puts it out again. Then he puts a fence on the front side and they come, they don't mind, they come right up to it, they're used to it. There's now a fence sitting here and they still keep coming to the food bowls. Then he puts a fence on one side, you know, it's national forest that way, he puts a fence on one side. They don't mind the L shape, they keep coming to the food bowls. He puts a fence on the third side. They keep coming in. They know where the food is. They keep coming in. And then one day he's sitting there, and as they come in, he raises the fourth side. And guess what? They're trapped. They're trapped. So how did he trap those animals? Those wily animals who couldn't be trapped. How did he trap them? He trained them to be dependent. They got lazy. 
that's a little bit like Ken's story about the hens. He got them so used to, he nearly bred it out of them. It was really the same generation, but even this generation can get trapped in that kind of thinking. And so this is something we all have to be aware of. When I ask, should the Fed pay more? Can the Fed pay more? You've got to be real careful because the, old, the Fed can only do one thing. The Feds can only take. Mm -hmm. They take from you or you that. organize it so they take from your neighbor. Ooh, that feels good. Yeah. Transient room tax reminds me of one of those things. I argued over and over and over again that we should not have a transient room tax. I argued over and over again that we should have a marketing campaign where we say Klamath County, the only county in Oregon with 0% transient room tax. Soundly defeated. Why? Because everybody thinks this is a cool deal. All the poor travelers who come to yep. Crater Lake from Japan have to pay the tax, don't get any benefit, and we get the benefit. Oh, aren't we benevolent? Aren't we caring? Don't we love tourists? And we've got a transient room tax. Anybody who borrows a pillow in Klamath County, even if it's in your bread and breakfast, we tax them 10%. Yes. What's it here, 12? Yeah. TRT is one of these things where we've convinced our local county officials to tax the other guy instead of ourselves. So instead of taking it from my hide, they take it from his hide, but I don't care. They have to take it. Or they don't raise taxes, and they take it from the next generation. They go into deficit spending, they print money, and they take it from children who aren't even born yet. Yeah. They're taking it today from your grandchildren. How many generations will it take to pay back $17 trillion? It's mathematically impossible. Yeah. And quite frankly, it is impossible. And that's only the real deficit. How about the unfunded actuarially accrued liabilities? 87 trillion. Yeah, 200 trillion dollars. I mean, this is astronomical. Look at it this way. Does, a, does a, the city of Grants Pass have unfunded actuarially accrued liabilities in their pension plan? Yeah, I'm sure they do. In, uh, in, so because you live in Grants Pass, they're going to take that rock, the unfunded liabilities, and they're going to put it in your backpack, and they're going to pat you on the head. And then you realize quickly when the guy, when the county guy comes up to you, that you live in Josephine County also, and Josephine County is going to put their unfunded actuarially accrued rock in your backpack. Now you've got the city and you've got the county. Oh hello. Oh no. You also live in the state of Oregon. The state of Oregon has unfunded actuarially accrued liabilities. This is a little bit bigger, and they're going to put this in your backpack. Oh, now I'm struggling to get down the road, but I'm doing okay. Then the federal government says, hey, pal, you live within these United States. Here's your burden from us. And they're just going to crush you. Yep. And we're dreaming all the while that as long as we get SRS money, we're out of this okay. If we get SRS money, we're going to be top dog in the state. We're going to get our sheriff back. Your sheriff is the least of your problems. This financial burden that's being put on your children and your grandchildren is going to be a problem that we have to deal with. What's the solution? Right? We're just stuck with this? Is there no solution? How do we get out of this? Do we have to do it based on tax? Or can we manage the resources? Can we use those mineral rights? Can we use those timber services? Can we transfer that public land to the states, counties, and to private industry? Can we turn a tree into a house? That's the question. Can we turn a tree into toothpicks, by golly, if that's the best way to go? How about chopsticks? I don't care, but can we make economic goods out of these resources? Or are we stuck sitting on our hands? 
This is the key. The key is, I don't want your money. I want my land. That's how you phrase it. I don't want your money. If you think about it, their money is worthless anyway. Right? That's true. What's it worth today out, out of a dollar? It should, uh, I'm getting hands three for cents. it. Hey, Kyle, you're out of that time. Four, four cents. Three cents. Yeah, four cents out of it. What happened to the rest of the dollar? Right. And, you know, so this money machine that makes us feel like we're prospering is really, it's a war on us producing Americans who are striving for prosperity, trying to live our lives. The reason this room isn't full is because people have lives. They've got kids in soccer, they've got kids in baseball, they've got kids in basketball, they are out on a picnic, they're gone fishing. They've got a thousand different things. They're over here at the gun show. They don't have time to get involved in this. And as long as the public is inattentive, we will face this problem. Thomas Jefferson said, if ever the public becomes inattentive, oops, if ever, the public becomes inattentive. He's talking to a friend, Ed Carrington, at the time. It's a written letter. If ever the people become inattentive, then you, Ed Carrington, a good bloke, and I, Thomas Jefferson, the father of liberty, if ever the people become inattentive, then you and I and the assemblies and the governors and the Congress shall you? become as wolves. Is that you? He recognized, Thomas Jefferson recognized this problem that we face. And today, the federal government has become the wolf in sheep's clothing with the all sorts of words for decency and politeness. It's political correctness, and it's really chicanery. It's really dishonest, and it's really thievery. They're taking money out of your pocket today. We've fallen in love with the idea that government can manage our problems. It's a political allocation scheme. Government can manage our problems. Just let them snap their fingers and make it so. In the Klamath Basin, because of political allocation of a scarce resource, water, we're drying up 30,000 acre feet, the 18,000 acres of land to, to get 30,000 acre feet spilled into the Klamath Basin to roll out and make salt water at the end of the day. This is a tragedy. We're not paying attention to an economic allocation of resources. We're paying attention to a political allocation of resources. And what happens when politics change? The world gets turned upside down again. No, but, no wonder nobody can make a sound economic decision. They don't know how to read. You don't know how to read the stock market. Are things going up? Is it just inflation? Is it another bubble? How many of you invested in housing and got creamed? It was a bubble. It was false. You thought it was real. You invested like it was real. Your money got snatched from you because it was not real. This is a problem we all face. So. What I'm going to suggest is we get involved in thinking in the same way that the creation of America was founded in a defensive maneuver, that we restore America by thinking about it in a defensive fashion. We, when I say defend, I mean defend our rights. Ken calls it offensive because he means take the battle to them. So, our, you know, the, I wish I would have organized my graph to sound more like his, but I'm thinking in terms of these rights belong to us because it's a duty, it's a moral obligation. We have the right to resist tyranny. It is our responsibility, it is our obligation. And this is where we need to go. And sovereignty, the idea of liberty, the idea of self-governance, has to happen in your own heart and soul. It's yourself that has to be involved in this idea. It will not work if you leave it to the other guys. 
because they'll manage your life for you. Yep. And we need to take control and take our lives back, take our self-governance back, take back what is rightfully ours. So these are uh, things I'm about out here. Um, I'll just close with this little comment from Jefferson. Jefferson, as you can tell, is one of these guys that really understood these core, core concepts. And he warns, it's not by the consolidation or concentration of power, but by their distribution that good government is affected. Mm -hmm. Distribute power, some in this county, some in that county, some in this city, some in that city. Not all concentrated in Washington, D.C. Look at if we had those lands in Oregon, and you thought they should be preserved, you're only a couple hours from Salem, you could get there in a minute. How long would it take you to book a flight? How much money would you have to spend? How many days off would you need? How many times would you get groped by the TSA to get to Washington, D.C.? And then who's going to listen to you once you're there? That's right. Nobody. Local control is the place to go. Local control with state reps, state centers, local control with county commissioners. Colleen is sitting here. Jump her before she gets out of this building. <laughs> oh. And uh, I'll close right here. I hope you guys enjoy. This has been the swirl in the toilet bowl. Ken's going to come back up here and try and tell you what you can do to get out of this mess we're in. We got to just go.